Good morning. Annyeong haseo. My name is Kirstine Kim. I am Professor of Theology and World Christianity at Leeds Trinity University in the United Kingdom. It is my great honor and privilege this morning to introduce this thematic plenary. As a missionary, mission theologian, and vice moderator of the WCC Commission on World Mission and Evangelism, it is also a source of pride to moderate this session where mission will be the focus of our attention. And it is a particular pleasure to welcome you all here in Korea, which is my husband's homeland, where I have lived and where I have family. Hwan Yong Ham Mida. Before we proceed with the main business, I would like to invite our General Secretary, Reverend Olav Fuchsetveit, to introduce three guests who bring greetings today. Reverend Veit. Good morning, everybody. Your Eminences, Excellencies, Sisters and Brothers in Christ. We are all back here in Busan after a very rich weekend. Some of us stayed here, some of us went to Seoul or other places. And you had significant experiences of seeing and listening and visiting the local churches here in Korea. Actually, with more time than we usually spend for this in the assembly, but we are grateful for all the reports about how important this has been for all of us, and therefore also for the assembly itself. And we convey our, again our thanks to the local host committee who prepared all these visits. We are coming to the second part of the work of the assembly, and we will continue with our thematic plenaries, ecumenical conversations, today also Madang workshops, and later on business sessions, harvesting the work of this assembly. I now announce to you that the, session, the business session tonight at 6.15, the business session tonight at 6.15, is a session with elections. And according to normal practices in the WCC, this is a closed session, so only delegates and the presidents participate in that session at 18.15. Before we now begin the mission plenary, I have the honor to present to you three guests and participants here presenting Greetings to us. First, the Right Reverend Bishop Dr. Munib A. Yunnan, Bishop of our most recent member church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land. Bishop Yunnan is here as the president of the Lutheran World Federation and will share with us now the greetings of the Christian World Communions for this assembly. Mr. Bishop Yunnan, welcome. Mr. Moderator, Dr. Altman, Mr. General Secretary, Dr. Dwight, Eminences, Excellences, Graces, Honorable Assembly Delegates and Participants, dear sisters and brothers in Christ. It's a joy and privilege to greet you today, the 10th Assembly of the World Council of Churches, gathering here in Busan on behalf of the Lutheran World Federation, but also on behalf of the Christian world communities, which based on the decision taken by the World Council of Churches Night Assembly in Porto Alegre, have been playing an integral part in the preparation of the present 10th Assembly in Busan. The quest for Christian unity has been an integral part of the self-understanding of the Lutheran World Federation since its formation in 1947. Through several processes of theological discussions with our ecumenical partners, 
we have learned that as much as ecumenical dialogue is about theological discernment, it's also about accompanying each other. It is about sharing the journey of faith, listening carefully to each other's experiences, and seeking justice in all contexts. The apostolicity of the church calls us to continue the tradition of visitation and hospitality, sharing spiritual, theological, and diaconical gifts as we respond to the call to the participate in God's mission. Our experience has been that joint theological engagement can be transformed into processes of healing memories, leading our churches from fragmentation and conflict toward growing communion and joint witness in the world. We thank the Lord that the Holy Spirit continues to guide us again to hear the prayer of Christ for unity, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me. From its beginning, the Lutheran World Federation has also committed itself to the call to accompany our, mar our vulnerable and marginalized neighbors. The LWF is committed to maintain human dignity for every migrant and refugee as we are doing in Dadaab campaign, uh, Dadaab camp in Kenya and Zaatari camp to the Syrian refugees in Jordan. We are grateful for the opportunity to bring our diaconal vocation to the joint effort to serve the world and to work for sustainable development and disaster response. The ACT Alliance is a vital expression of this shared effort. Our joint service as churches has transformed not just the communities we serve, but has become an important conduit of great understanding among Christian communities. As the LWF is looking together with our ecumenical partners toward the 500th anniversary of the, for the Reformation in 2017, there is an increasing need to strengthen the link between theological discernment and diaconal service in the world. As people who have in been encountered by Christ, we are called to meet and accompany the poor and the vulnerable. In this accompaniment, the message of reconciliation entrusted for us allows us to proclaim the wholeness into the midst of a fragmented world. Knowing that we receive this gift from God alone, we continue to believe that the global body of Christ, the church, has to raise its prophetic voice in our fragmented world in unity and to address issues of justice and peace and human rights, including gender justice, economic justice, environmental justice, and religious freedom. We continue to work for justice in and for the unity of this peninsula on which our assembly is being held. God of life, bring justice and peace to this country and to all who call it home. As I bring this greeting to you in my capacity as president of the Lutheran World Federation, I bring it also with my own identity and history as an Arab Christian and with my specific rootedness in the Middle East and the Holy Land. Hence, I bring also the greetings from the holy city of Jerusalem, a city yearning for wholeness and peace. With the entire LWF communion, I continue to believe that peace based on justice and reconciliation based on forgiveness is still possible in the Holy Land and is still possible in the Middle East. <laughs> With the ecumenical movement, we continue to express, we continue to call, to call for a shared Jerusalem for the three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and two nations 
Palestinians and Israelis. I want to express our gratitude to the World Council of Churches for the ongoing support through both the Palestine-Israel Ecumenical Forum and the Ecumenical Accompanied Program in Palestine and Israel. Together with the work of the Lutheran World Federation on the Mount of Olives and many other ministries of various Christian churches in Jerusalem, these are all powerful signs of hope that need to be sustained. I want to particularly give thanks for the strong resolve with which the World Council of Churches is taking up the challenging realities regarding the Arab and Middle East Christian presence and witness in the Middle East. God of life, lead us to justice and peace. May the Holy Spirit continue leading the work of this assembly. The prophet Micah addresses us still today. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? May God bless you all. And may the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless the ongoing witness of this world, of this assembly, and World Council of Churches. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bishop Yunan. And let me take this opportunity to thank the Lutheran World Federation under its leadership of the General Secretary Martin Junge and yourself for the very excellent cooperation we have from day to day. I also want to express how the grateful we are that the relationships to these Christian world communions who are also represented here have developed and also been solidified in this year in a very collegial way. I now invite Dr. Thomas Schirmacher, who has been working with the World Council of Churches on many significant issues for us, representing the World Evangelical Alliance. And I invite him to present greetings from them now. Lady Moderator, Dr. Altmann, Mr. General Secretary, Excellencies, Eminences, Graces, leaders of the different churches, and altogether sisters and brothers in our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you very much for the invitation to bring greetings to the plenary session of the General Assembly of the World Council of Churches and its many member churches from around the globe represented here. On behalf of the World Evangelical Alliance, representing churches with some 600 million Christians worldwide, I do so on behalf of our Secretary General, Jeff Tunnicliffe, the Director of Ecumenical Affairs, Rolf Fille, who is sitting in the pew somewhere here, as well and on behalf of the commissions and boards that are represented here, which are the International Council, the Theological Commission, the Religious Liberty Commission, and the Mission Commission. We are glad to be part of the ongoing program, having a representative on the program committee, on the Mission Commission, and I'm myself glad to serve on the Public Issue Committee that is very gracious that we are not just guests, but can be involved in developing Christian unity together with you. When the Evangelical Alliance was established in 1846, it thought to work in four primary areas of concern. First, Christian unity. Second, human rights, and at that time in particular in the abolition of slavery. World evangelism. And fourth, religious freedom for all. 160 years later, these are still the four primary concerns of the World Evangelical Alliance. Those four areas never were combined more clearly than in the first ever joint statement signed by the Vatican, the World Council of Churches, and the World Evangelical Alliance, entitled 
Christian Witness in a Multi-Religious World, Recommendations for Conduct. The General Secretary of the World Council of Churches already emphasized its historic importance in his report to the General Assembly. The document speaks clearly against any kind of unethical way of doing mission. Witnessing to the gospel should never be done in a way that overrules the human dignity and the human rights of others. This is a document that fulfills all four historic concerns of the World Evangelical Alliance. Christian unity, because we did it together um, with as many Christian bodies as never before. Human rights, because they are the border, even for our mission work, how we relate to other people. A positive outlook on mission and evan evangelism, and at the same time a major step for defining religious freedom. Having been involved in this process for five years myself, I was very amazed about the unity we found in agreement in the first sentence, which I now read. Mission belongs to the very being of the church. Therefore, proclaiming the word of God and witnessing to the world is essential for every Christian. However, it is necessary to do so according to gospel principles, with full respect and love for all human beings. Whoever would have had imagined some decades ago that the Vatican, the World Council of Churches, and the World Evangelical Alliance would start a document like this. We are very grateful to the World Council of Churches for its flexibility to include the World Evangelical Alliance in this project and keeping the process going for several years. And you can imagine it was not just a nice flow, but up and down. Originally, I got involved in the process as expert on the side of the World Council of Churches. We ended up with the World Evangelical Alliance having become a full partner in the drafting with the result that all our 128 nations, national member bodies, without any exception, accepted the text. A historic thing in our own history. This has resulted in a historic document where the majority of world Christianity, I don't know, 95, 97% of world Christianity, spoke with one voice to themselves, to all Christians, as well as to the states and the world public. And presently, the document goes from one country to the next and furthers Christ Christian unity on a very broad base. World Council of Churches and World Evangelical Alliance thus have a common experience in giving Christian unity worldwide a higher priority than furthering their own organization. One well-developed example, again together with the Roman Catholic Church and other Christian world communions, is the Global Christian Forum, which the World Evangelical Alliance fully, 100%, endorses on a global and a regional level. This open platform makes it obvious that no longer are our specific organizations the main focus, but the unity of Christians itself. It reaches out to those churches and Christians who for some reason or the other still are outside any global ecumenical community with the goal to include all churches, all Christians in this work together. And the Global Christian Forum from our point of view can become a very helpful resource in helping resolve some of the ongoing conflicts within the Christian family and some of the very difficult topic like, for example, proselytism among Christian communities. Evangelical is a broad term that can be used to designate all kinds of groups. Definitions vary. So we urgently ask you not to mix what so-called evangelicals do or say with what the World Evangelical Alliance stands for. We want to take responsibility for what we as a global community say, do, and agree on. 
but we cannot influence what happens outside our membership, sometimes even if the, in the name of evangelicalism. Often enough, we are ourselves are the goal of attacks by those evangelicals. We want to make it very clear our interest is Christian unity, and whenever we have to discuss theological differences, we want it to do in an open-minded, in a polite, in a friendly way, in listening to each other and not protesting against each other. Evangelism is the proclamation in word, deed, and Christian character of the saving work of Jesus Christ on the cross and through the resurrection. He alone overcame sin and can forgive and overcome sin. The World Evangelical Line stands for what we call holistic evangelism or integral mission. We emphasize the connection between both proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ in word and practicing in, it our, in, in our actions. Both are necessary for the integrity of the gospel. Furthermore, personal conversion must result in the growth of Christian character and witness and in the interest to further the good in the whole world in any respect. There have been times when we made mistakes and evangelicals have struggled to link the proclamation of the gospel with acts of justice and peace, no question. Yet in our history, there have been many strong voices and lives that exemplify the holistic nature of evangelism and, by God's grace, are we on a good way to recover this aspect of witness to the gospel in the world and this together with the World Council of Churches. As mentioned, religious freedom was a central focus of World Evangelical Alliance already in the middle of the 19th century when there still were a lot of people who even did not know how to spell religious freedom. Yeah. Therefore, I cannot finish my greetings without mentioning our lovely host country, Korea, in its divided situation. We join others in working towards the reunification of Korea but coming from Germany, I can understand the feelings accompanying this, even though the situation of the two divided countries is very different in detail. But as in Germany, we believe that human rights and freedom, including religious freedom, is the real goal of anything we do, and reunification only can be the result or the tool, but is not the mean itself. The mean is to get freedom and human rights for all people. South Korea has a good history progressism from dictatorship to a functioning democracy. Receiving many shocking reports about the situation in North Korea, we want to work and pray for a day in which the people in North Korea will experience freedom, including religious freedom, and Christians in the North and South can unite in worshiping the Savior. Thus, we ask God's blessing on all the ongoing work of the General Assembly of the World Council of Churches May God the Father give us all the strength to work on behalf of his creation. May Jesus Christ, who saved us from sin and death, be our example, willing to give his life for the good of others. And may the Holy Spirit keep us from all evil ways and unjust thoughts and lead us into the growing truth promised to his church on earth. Thank you so much, Dr. Schirmacher, and we ask you to please convey warm greetings to General Secretary Jeff Tunicliffe, who was not able to be with us in this assembly. We again have the honor to invite a representative from another faith community to greet us. I invite Rabbi Dr. David Fox Sandmel, representing the International Jewish Committee on Interreligious Consultation, to take the floor. Shalom. It is my honor and privilege to bring greetings on behalf of the International Jewish Committee on Interreligious Consultations to this plenary session of the 10th General Assembly of the World Council of Churches. 
The International Jewish Committee on Interreligious Consultation represents reform, conservative, and orthodox Jewish movements, the Anti-Defamation League, the American Jewish Committee, B'nai B'rith International, the Israel Jewish Council for Interreligious Relations, and the World Jewish Congress. It was founded over 40 years ago to cultivate religions with other international re relations with other international religious bodies. This past week, as part of synagogue worship, we read from the book of Genesis, from Parashat Toldot, about the birth of Jacob and Esau, twins who, from conception, as it seemed, were destined to be enemies. We read how in the womb, Vayitro Tsutsum Habanim Bakirba, how in the womb they struggled with one another. Throughout the centuries, Jewish and Christian biblical commentators often understood the relationship between our two traditions to be reflected if not foretold in this struggle. Each community considered itself to be Jacob, or as he came to be known, Yisrael, Israel, God's true and only covenantal partner. Each saw the other as Esau, who rejected God and God's promises. These mutually exclusive interpretations resulted in distrust and enmity, violence and persecution, including within living memory the destruction of six million Jews in the Shoah, the Holocaust. It is therefore with deep gratitude that we remember that the World Council of Churches at its founding meeting in 1948 in Amsterdam stated unequivocally, anti-Semitism is a sin against God and man. In light of this history, we Jews view with horror the growing violence against Christians and Christians' communities in places such as Egypt, Syria, India, Nigeria, Indonesia, and Pakistan. We are dismayed that the world seems to ignore the suffering that is being inflicted. It is particularly unjust to the peoples in those places and prolongs their pain when their plight is minimized and hypocritical when other conflicts are spuriously given as the reason for their situation, let alone identified as more important. We gather here in Busan as Israelis and Palestinians are in the midst of negotiations that, we pray, will lead to the establishment of a Palestinian state alongside Israel so that Jews, Christians, and Muslims can live in peace with one another and worship without fear at their holy sites. We are heartened by those on all sides who are working not only to achieve a political solution, but who also strive together to overcome trauma such as the Parent Circle Family Forum, a joint Palestinian-Israeli organization of over 600 families, all of whom have lost a close family member as a result of the prolonged conflict, and whose activities have shown that the reconciliation between individuals and nations is possible. These brave families teach us that peace can only come if the subjective perceptions of justice on all sides are considered and respected. I note here as well Israeli hospitals where Jewish and Arab physicians and nurses are treating hundreds of wounded Syrian men, women, and children, as well as Israel, an Israeli NGO that provides disaster relief around the world and is currently working quietly with Syrian refugees in Jordan. These examples show us how people from different nations and traditions can be, in the words of Isaiah, repairers of the breach and restorers of the lanes for habitation. I now turn back to Genesis. We should also remember that the conflict between Jacob and Esau is not the end of their story. 
In two weeks, we Jews will read about the reconciliation between the two brothers in Genesis 33 and how they later cooperated with one another to bury their father Isaac, Genesis 35, 29. It seems that they were able to overcome the strife that began in the womb. Today, in many parts of the world, Jews and Christians now live in harmony. While we disagree on whether the Messiah is to come or come again, we are, in the facilitous phrase of the Christian theologian Clark Williamson, partners in waiting. Until that day, we can and must work together to alleviate suffering, promote justice, and repair our world for the reign of God. Kain yehi ratzon, may this be God's will. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robbie, Dr. Sandmel. You recently also visited Geneva, and we had time to talk together uh, about also the future we plan together in cooperation with WCC and Ichkik. And we realize, as you say today, we have a lot we could and we should do together for justice and peace. Thank you. We now leave the floor to you, Professor Kim, and we look forward to the mission plenary. Thank you. Mission is integral to the ecumenical story, and one of the four goals of the World Council of Churches is to promote common witness. So it is that we devote this plenary to the topic of mission. It is especially appropriate that we consider mission here in Korea. The Korean churches are known worldwide for their efforts to evangelize the peninsula in terms of spreading the good news and growing churches. And Korean Christians are famous as martyrs for the faith and advocates of freedom and justice. Today, there is a vibrant overseas missionary movement from Korea, and Korean churches give generously to enable gospel proclamation, social service, and unity around the world. Today's plenary on mission is informed by the new World Council of Churches statement on mission and evangelism. Together Towards Life, Mission and Evangelism in Changing Landscapes. You have all received a copy of this statement as you came in, uh, packaged together with a study guide and a CD um, that looks like this. So I hope you have that um, with you, please, if you don't get one on the way out. You'll also find the statement in the resource book for this assembly. In keeping with the assembly theme, the new statement declares that the church is commissioned to celebrate life and to resist and transform all life-destroying forces in the power of the Holy Spirit. In order to bring about justice and peace, the statement calls the church to communicate the good news of Jesus Christ with persuasion inspiration, and conviction. This plenary has two objectives. The first is to highlight common challenges and new opportunities in mission in light of new developments globally. The second objective is to inspire renewed commitment to the call for common witness. To address these, we have prepared an action-oriented program 
intended to enhance ecumenical cooperation in future mission work. The plenary will comprise of three presentations interspersed with two videos and a cultural performance. The presentations will reflect on, first, mission as participation in the work of the life-giving spirit. Reverend Professor Stephen Bevans will make a take a theological approach that recognizes the big picture of the changing landscapes of world mission today and emphasizes the dynamic and transformative nature of mission in the spirit. In the second presentation, Reverend Cecilia Castillo Anhari, speaking in Spanish, will explore new ways of witnessing to the gospel of life and point to concrete actions for doing evangelism in contemporary contexts. And third, Bishop Givargis Mor Corilos will introduce the new mission statement, Together Towards Life as a holistic view of mission towards fullness of life in justice and peace. He will illustrate some of the concrete life-affirming changes that this kind of mission has made in multi-religious contexts especially. The first of the two videos is a production of the Commission on World Mission and Evangelism, which focuses on mission in changing landscapes. The second video, comes from Commission Partners and shares inspiring contextual examples of mission work in line with the new statement. We shall be helped in our reflections by the Teatro Ecumenical of the National Council of Churches in the Philippines, who will illustrate the meaning of Together Towards Life in drama, music, and dance. The plenary will conclude with a call to you to churches and partners to strengthen our ecumenical cooperation in mission. So we offer our reflection and call to action in mission, beginning with a video. When commissioners of the CWME came together in the Cook Islands, it was to reflect on how the new mission statement could be turned into a living statement that churches could use to guide their mission activities. In an ever-changing world, a statement like this is very important. Every organization needs a mission statement um, to direct its future, um, to help it to um, define where it's come from, where it's going. Well, we thought we needed a, a new mission statement precisely because the old one was uh, getting somewhat outdated. I'm so happy to see that the new mission statement is provoking a fresh interest in mission today. So I think that when we have a mission statement, then we actually go back to the authentic rule, uh, roots of what ecumenical movement is or should be about. The Cook Islands, and in particular the island of Atutaki, represents a unique glimpse into the history of mission. This is where the first Christians arrived in the South Pacific. John Williams of the London Missionary Society came here in 1821 with Papia and Vahapata. They were two newly converted missionaries from Tahiti, and it was their task to bring Christianity to the Cook Islands. Papia made remarkable progress, and John Williams used him to take up the greater challenges on Rorotonga, the largest island in the Cook Island group. Partnership in mission was now part of history and almost a hundred years later found its modern expression in 1910 in Edinburgh. The first mission conference had lofty ideals. The call to action was to evangelize the world in one generation. 
This call is today considered to be the symbolic start of the ecumenical movement. It was in Edinburgh that the decision was made to establish an organization, the International Mission Council, which would work for cooperation between Protestant mission councils. The First World War had a huge impact on the Second World Mission Conference, held in Jerusalem in 1928. The war saw Christian fighting Christian, and this challenged the ideal that Western civilization was the embodiment of the gospel. The third mission conference was held in 1938 in Tamba Am, India. Fascist regimes were on the rise in Europe. How was the church to react to this new reality? What would the role of the church be in mission during this era? The conference in Whitby, Canada in 1947 was much smaller. The world was going through fundamental changes after the shock of the Second World War. Countries and the relations between people had to be rebuilt. The focus would now be partnership and obedience to the Word of God. The conference also decided to foster a good relationship with the newly formed World Council of Churches. The WCC held their first assembly in Amsterdam in 1948. The next conference in Willingen, Germany in 1952 was to prove a watershed for the IMC. Events in China were a direct threat to the mission enterprise there and in the rest of the world. When China uh, was taken over by the Mao's revolution, many of the faith missionaries who were in China, as you know, were expelled. Mm. And many of them came to Latin America in, in the 40s, wow. you see? So many of them came to work with many evangelical churches. Mm -hmm. And they came with a conservative type Christianity, but also, I think, with, you know, an, an anti-communist type of uh, Christianity. The delegates rediscovered that mission was first of all an act of God. Missio Dei, or the mission of God, emerged as the key concept. It was a revolutionary change in thought. In 1958, the IMC met in Akimoto near Accra, in Ghana. They debated a proposal to unite with the World Council of Churches. A great majority accepted the proposal. The mission councils affiliated with the IMC became affiliated with the CWME and the IMC ceased to exist. Now, part of the WCC, the CWME organized world mission conferences every seven to eight years in between the WCC assemblies. The first meeting of the newly formed CWME was held in 1963 in Mexico City with the theme, Mission in Six Continents. The Bangkok Conference in 1972 became famous for its holistic approach to the theme, Salvation Today. The concept of contextual theology was also put forward at Bangkok. The Melbourne Conference of 1980 was heavily influenced by the liberation theologies of Latin America. With the theme, Your Kingdom Come, the conference insisted that the poor and the churches that served them should be given their rightful place in God's mission. The church had to begin to make a change in how it viewed the world, in how its own work would begin to develop in the kinds of projects that suddenly presented themselves. Much of Melbourne's insights are found in the document Mission and Evangelism, an ecumenical affirmation, which was adopted by the WCC Central Committee in 1982. It remains a fundamental text on mission. The conference in San Antonio, Texas in 1989 became famous for the statement on the relation between Christianity and other religions. The statement said that the church couldn't point to another way to salvation than through Jesus Christ. At the same time, they had to acknowledge that the church could not put a limit on God's saving power. The last WCC World Mission Conference of the century took place in 1996 in Salvador de Bahia in Brazil. It was fully dedicated to the relation between the gospel and culture. 
Salvador recognized the fundamental equal value of all cultures, but also their ambiguity. The conference in Athens in 2005 was held for the first time in a majority orthodox context. The delegates were reminded of the priority of God's Holy Spirit in mission. I think the Commission of World Mission and Evangelism has got a wider perspective trying to bring um, Christians of all faith traditions to contribute to the success of the Commission. So they have a, a role to be played by Pentecostals. And now as a Pentecostal within the Commission, I bring out Pe Pentecostal's perspective of issue. The churches were called to be ambassadors of reconciliation, and in particular to build, renew, and multiply spaces where humans could experience something of God's healing and reconciling grace. We, we stand before a, a challenging opportunity to develop dynamic, multi-directional outreach of the good news for all, to all. To achieve this, a process was initiated after the Porto Alegre conference to come up with a new statement on mission and evangelism. For a week, the commissioners work intensively on the new statement in Ghana in November 2011. The process of uh, formulating the new mission and evangelism statement has been a long, intense and rigorous process. The new statement was presented to the CWME at a pre-assembly mission event in Manila during March 2012. 200 representatives of WCC member churches and affiliated mission bodies worked to finalize the document that would take mission forward. It was presented to the WCC Central Committee meeting in Crete, Greece on the 5th of September 2012. It was unanimously approved as the new official position statement on mission and evangelism. From here, the Cook Islands, where partnership in mission was born, commissioners can now reflect on how this new statement on mission and evangelism will guide the work of God's mission into a new era. One of the challenges with the mission statement is it, it is a snapshot. It's a, a statement of intent at a particular time, and the world goes on changing around it. Well, I think it's, it's a huge uh, challenge for the Commission and for the World Council of Churches and for all the congregations to accept it as their own. It is a very important step that the study guide is being uh, developed now. It is not the end of the road at all. It's only the beginning of uh, a new stage of the ongoing journey. I would like to invite the all people who are interested in, who are committed to God's vision, to join in to the di new direction and new concept of mission which has been produced by the new mission statement. Our first speaker, Reverend Professor Stephen Bevans, is a priest in the Catholic Missionary Congregation of the Society of the Divine Word, and he comes from the United States. Ordained in 1971, he served as a missionary in the Philippines till 1981. He is currently Professor of Mission and Culture at the Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. He is also a member of the core faculty of the Global Ecumenical Theological Institute, Getty. Professor Bevans. The Holy Spirit is the principal agent 
of the whole of the church's mission. Mission is finding out where the Spirit is at work and joining in. These two lines are from two of the most revered religious leaders of our time. The first was written by Pope John Paul II in his landmark encyclical, The Mission of the Redeemer. The second is from a speech to evangelical Anglicans by the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams. It is with the same conviction and the same faith in the Holy Spirit that the document we present to you this morning has been written. It is with the same conviction and the same faith in the Holy Spirit that this document proposes a fresh, dynamic approach to engaging in the work of mission and evangelism in today's changing landscapes. Mission, the document proclaims, is rooted in the overflowing love and world-embracing communion of the triune God. God is mission. That mission is the creation, protection, and redemption of all creation. Mission is about cosmic flourishing. God's mission works with and within all creation to lead it to justice and peace. God's mission works with and within all creation to lead it to life in abundance. God's mission is God's holy mystery calling the entire creation into life-giving communion through Jesus the Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is God's power, present and active, from the first nanosection, sec, nanosecond of creation. The Spirit is God's power, guiding the formation of gases, and countless number of stars. The Spirit is God's power guiding the process of emerging life. Microbes, koalas, elephants, trees, human beings on this tiny planet in an average-sized galaxy, and perhaps life on so many more planets than we can imagine. The Spirit is God's power at the origins of the world's religions and the creative, healing, prophetic, and life-giving presence of God in Israel's history. The Spirit is God's power taking flesh and a human face in the life and atoning work of Jesus of Nazareth. It is the Spirit who anointed Jesus at His baptism in the Jordan. It is the Spirit who worked through Him in preaching good news to the poor, healing the lame, giving sight to the blind, proclaiming forgiveness to sinners in a year of favor to the Lord. He came that humanity might have life, and have it more abundantly. It is the Spirit in whom he cried out, Abba, Father. And it was surely the Spirit who gave him the courage to endure his passion and death on the cross for our salvation. It is in the Spirit that the Father raised him from the dead, and it is the Spirit that Jesus breathed on the disciples, sending them as the Father had sent Him, so that they would be agents of life as well. The same Spirit anointed those 
fearful, timid disciples at Pentecost in the same way that Jesus himself had been anointed. And it was the Spirit, as we read in the Acts of the Apostles, who expanded the early community's vision to see that all peoples, all nations, all cultures, all lands are included in God's offer of abundant life. The Spirit leads us together towards life. Together in the Spirit, we commit ourselves to lead our world towards life. That life comes in its fullness when women and men accept Jesus' identity as God's true icon among us who has poured out life-giving forgiveness in his ministry, death, and resurrection, who has shared his spirit with us. We acknowledge that it is the spirit who is the principal agent of communicating that good, life-giving news, and that our task is, first of all, to find out where the spirit is at work in the world and then join in that life-giving work. What this document proclaims is that the Spirit is at work in movements of eco-justice throughout the world, from tree huggers in India to tree planters in Zimbabwe, from green seminary projects in the United States to green parties in Europe, from efforts to save species in the Brazilian rainforest to efforts to save the whales in our oceans. Mission is recognizing that here the Spirit is at work and calls Christians to join in. What this document proclaims is that, that, in the, is that the Spirit is at work in movements throughout the world that privilege the poor and the marginalized. It proclaims boldly that mission is not so much to the poor and marginalized peoples as from them to those of us at the privileged center. They are... They are where the Spirit is working, and the task of all Christians is to join in in action, solidarity, resistance, and struggle. What this document proclaims is that the Spirit is at work among all cultures, all peoples, and all religions, and that the work of contextualizing or enculturating the gospel, as well as the hard, difficult, and sometimes dangerous work of interreligious dialogue, is where the Spirit is at work, calling us to join in. What this document proclaims is that the Spirit is at work in the hearts of all women and men calling them gently, yet persuasively, to the way, the truth, and the life found in Jesus of Nazareth, the Savior and Redeemer of the world. It is Jesus who shows us the face of the Father, especially on the cross, where he gave up his spirit, and in the resurrection, where he shared his spirit with us, the church. It is to the work of spreading this good news of the true face of God that, that the Spirit calls us to join in. When we see the true face of God, our hearts are stirred to conversion and repentance, our sins are forgiven, we turn to one another in peace, we work together for justice, we band together to protect creation. We recognize God's Spirit in all peoples, cultures, and religions. The Spirit is the principal agent of mission. Mission 
is finding out where the Spirit is working and joining in. Veni Sancte Spiritus. Come, Holy Spirit. Ven, Espiritu Santo. Vien, Saint Esprit. Oso su sung Leon Nim. Lead us together towards justice and peace. Lead us together towards life. While humans are being created, they seek to answer the world's question. Why is life so disordered? What is the beginning and end of comfort and suffering? What is the human desire? Change, everything changes. Change, nothing is missed by change. So when the time is ripe, go ahead and face a challenge. Change. Oh, oh, oh. 
Our next presenter, Reverend Cecilio Castillo and Hari, will be speaking in Spanish. She is a Pentecostal from the Pentecostal Mission Church in Chile. She is coordinator of the Ministry of Women and Gender Justice of the Latin American Council of Churches, CLI, and she's also engaged in numerous projects of the Evangelical Church of the Lutheran Confession in Brazil. From 2000 to 2007, she was part of the joint consultative group between the World Council of Churches and Pentecostals. Reverend Cecilia. Ando llorando pa dentro aunque me ría pa' fuera y así yo tengo que vivir esperando a que me muera ando llorando pa' dentro aunque me ría pa' fuera y así yo tengo que vivir Esperando a que me muera. Vengo de un largo y estrecho país ubicado al fin del mundo según la lectura geográfica tradicional que me enseñaron en la escuela. Vengo de la tierra de Gabriela Mistral, de Violeta Parra, de Isabel Allende. Vengo de un país de mujeres sindicalistas, feministas, parlamentarias, trabajadoras rurales e indígenas. Vengo de la tierra de tantas marías de la vida que en su lucha diaria crean alternativas de vida y vida en resistencia. Vengo de un continente de mujeres sensiblemente empoderadas. Queridos hermanos y hermanas, vengo de Latinoamérica y el Caribe, tierra de mestizajes, de pueblos originarios y afrodescendientes que con sus diversos hilos culturales Tejen la trama de nuestro continente. América Latina y el Caribe se debaten permanentemente entre grotescas contradicciones. Dándose cita la extrema riqueza económica de algunos pocos y el vivir al día de una gran mayoría. Las migraciones y desplazamientos nos muestran el rostro de mujeres que solas o con sus hijos e hijas tienen que sufrir el éxodo de su tierra en búsqueda de otras oportunidades que les sean más favorables para su sustento diario. ¿Para qué decir de la trata y tráfico de niñas y mujeres? que realizada en este momento por los sistemas esclavistas actuales, nos muestran de manera vergonzosa que no hay respeto por la vida humana. En nombre del dinero fácil, se venden nuestras voluntades y conciencias.
la violencia basada en género contra la mujer, la violencia doméstica e intrafamiliar que conjuntamente con el feminicidio es posible que aparezcan visiblemente denunciadas antes los tribunales de justicia, pero que para la gran mayoría se han convertido en temas banales, que el sensacionalismo de los medios de comunicación social muestran para captar su audiencia. A veces, a veces, son temas de oraciones tímidas y descomprometidas desde nuestras iglesias, afirmando para las mujeres que es la voluntad de Dios el aceptarlas. Y en este escenario, ¿dónde encontramos a las personas con discapacidad? También las hemos invisibilizado. El hambre que continúa asolando al mundo, las guerras realizadas en nombre de la paz, la dimensión mercantilcéntrica de todo en todo, donde el ser humano y el medio ambiente parecen un pretexto. La tecnología puesta como bien de consumo, y no un bien de servicio. En fin, es un panorama que para quienes estamos presentes en esta plenaria, creo que no nos resulta tan desconocido, quizás con algunas pequeñas diferencias. Se habla de pues, posmodernidad en nuestras tierras. Y yo me pregunto, ¿será que la modernidad llegó alguna vez a nuestros países? ¿Para quiénes? ¿De qué manera? ¿Y para qué? Todo esto está más complejo actualmente. Pero miren una cosa, los problemas básicos, los problemas humanos, los de la gente común continúan ahí mismo. Solamente hay otro ropaje que les cubre. Parafraseando a nuestra querida compañera y amiga, la pastora Nancy Cardoso, Podemos decir en portugués, perder tiempo, perder amigas y amigos, perder, perder a voz y a memoria. Ya nos acostumamos a vivir tantas perdas en la nuestra vida que casi ya no podemos hablar de ella. Sobrevivemos. Y las iglesias, ¿qué pasa con nuestras iglesias? Infelizmente no escapan tampoco del panorama anterior. Muchas de ellas, aprovechándose de la fe sencilla, la mercantilizan y la venden como más un producto de consumo rápido y descomprometida de las realidades. Creo que al parecer las iglesias intentan ponerse nuevas ropas evangelizadoras para no perder terreno, alejándose de lo esencial del Evangelio y de los verdaderos problemas humanos. Es difícil escuchar eso, parece. Pero en relación a las mujeres... Las iglesias nuestras continúan, y escuchémoslo bien, nuestras iglesias continúan queriendo controlar nuestra sexualidad, nuestro cuerpo 
y reproducción, como también continúan sustentando un único concepto de familia que a veces ya no es fiel a nuestras realidades en diversos países. No podemos creer que hasta hoy en América Latina y en otras regiones del mundo, el reconocimiento integral de los derechos humanos de las mujeres y de las personas no son debatidos ni adoptados en las iglesias completamente, siendo a veces apoyados por lecturas bíblicas androcéntricas y descontextualizadas. Y en medio de todo este panorama está el Evangelio, está el Evangelio. Y la pregunta que no quiere callar, ¿cómo dar testimonio del Evangelio de la vida en medio de toda esta realidad? En nuestro contexto latinoamericano y en otros lugares del mundo, Sabemos que el agua, el pan, el trabajo y la vida digna es un bien apreciado. Es la buena noticia de la que queremos testimoniar y no es posible, hermanos y hermanas, hacerlo si nuestras formas de entender la evangelización están insertas en el consumo, el lucro y el continuamente acumular. Hay que denunciar este mercantilismo de las iglesias, como Jesús en el templo con el látigo que lo rompió todo, Jesús fue duro con el mercantilismo y apuntó siempre para una comunidad, para un contexto, apuntó para la humanidad, para la sanidad y la justicia, apuntó para el compartir del pan. Conversando con mi amiga y pastora luterana Heidi Yarchel, nos preguntamos, esto es tan antiguo, hermanos y hermanas, pero tan actual en nuestra realidad. Quizás evangelizarnos y no evangelizar a los otros y a las otras. Quizás es un camino necesario y prioritario para pensar. Reencantarnos. Y creerle al anuncio de Jesús de la buena noticia. Evangelizarnos significa estar en estrecho diálogo, en cercanía solidaria, mirando a los ojos del otro y de la otra, de la manera que Jesús dialogó en su encuentro con la mujer samaritana, con sus seguidores y con sus seguidoras. El Evangelio y el buen vivir. Good living is the concept. Para testimoniar el Evangelio, tenemos mucho que aprender desde las culturas y las espiritualidades que emergen desde lo ancestral de los pueblos originarios. El buen vivir de las culturas indígenas rescata la vida desde otra perspectiva, contraponiéndose al sistema capitalista de consumo que no engendra un buen vivir. En palabras de la pastora Olla Barros, de Brasil, ella dice que buen vivir es el ideal buscado por el hombre y por la mujer de las culturas indígenas. Este traducido como la plenitud de la vida, el bienestar social, económico, político, que los pueblos todos desean. El buen vivir entendido como el desarrollo pleno de los pueblos. El buen vivir implica un cuestionamiento sustancial a las ideas contemporáneas de desarrollo y en especial a su vínculo con el crecimiento económico y su capacidad de resolver los problemas actuales de la pobreza, olvidándose que sus prácticas traen severos impactos sociales y ambientales. 
sus actitudes son desafío para nuestra vida hoy y nuestra misión especialmente, pues no existe bien vivir, un buen vivir y convivir sin una permanente actitud de diálogo entre nosotros y nosotras. ¿No sería esto también? Es la pregunta. ¿Es dar testimonio en esencia del Evangelio de la vida? Creo que testimoniar el Evangelio de la vida tiene que ver con las experiencias de las juventudes, jóvenes, varones y mujeres, que a través de diversas campañas contra el maltrato y talleres sobre los derechos reproductivos y sexuales, denuncian malas prácticas anquilosadas en nuestras iglesias y sociedades patriarcales. Anunciando a la vez que hay cambios de paradigmas y nuevos tiempos entre las generaciones. Creo que testimoniar en medio de la vida tiene que ver con las experiencias de las pastorales de mujeres que reunidas en pequeños grupos se encuentran para acogerse, reflexionar la palabra, orar en sororidad, aprender la una de la otra, compartir el pan en la mesa y especialmente crecer en sus espiritualidades a través del diálogo sororal. También estas mujeres testimonian el Evangelio de la vida con sus voces activas, denunciando las malas prácticas en las iglesias, de la no justicia de género, incidiendo en las políticas públicas y sociedad civil para una mejor calidad de vida, marchando muchas veces por la calle junto a otras mujeres y varones, denunciando los crímenes contra los derechos humanos. Testimoniar el Evangelio de la vida significa para las mujeres reunir la moneda más pequeña en cada comunidad de fe alrededor del mundo, que son esfuerzos solidarios que garantizan la realización de experiencias y proyectos de otras mujeres y jóvenes que buscan el buen vivir. Mientras reflexionaba sobre todo esto, apareció la siguiente noticia en la agencia latinoamericana y caribeña, de que el pastor cubano Héctor Méndez ha caracterizado su labor pastoral por darle un sentido práctico dentro del radio de acción donde está enclavada su comunidad eclesial, una de las barriadas más pobres y populosas de la capital cubana, eminentemente obrera, trabajando en aspectos tan importantes como la creación de una biblioteca pública, de una línea telefónica para consejería y ayuda en temas como la sexualidad, la droga, el alcohol y hasta la creación de un equipo de fútbol que ha servido para acercar niños y jóvenes a esa congregación y dar un testimonio de que la iglesia no es un espacio aséptico dentro de su enclave físico, sino que la iglesia debe contaminarse y contaminar a los demás con su sentido esperanzador y por darle motivación a la vida. Creemos que estos son ejemplos concretos del testimoniar la buena noticia en medio de la vida. Hermanos y hermanas, basta de formas estereotipadas de evangelizar, descontextualizadas y desarraigadas de los contextos políticos, sociales y culturales en que estamos insertas e insertos. Creo que como iglesias, primeramente reunidas en el Dios trino y uno, convocadas por el habitar, juntas en armonía agradable, no nos podemos limitar a encasillar ni vender el Evangelio al mejor postor. La misión que abrazamos es que el Evangelio sea camino de vida, de buen vivir para todo el mundo. A partir de lo que hemos reflexionado hasta ahora, nos preguntamos cómo nuestro trabajo como iglesias cristianas ¿Cómo la manera de evangelizar o evangelizarnos ha traído buen vivir? ¿Cómo nos hemos colocado delante del otro y de la otra? ¿Y cuál es nuestra actitud? 
En el documento Juntos por la Vida, es importante destacar que la evangelización se lleva a cabo con una actitud humilde de despojo de sí mismo, en el respeto a los otros y otras y en diálogo con las personas de culturas y religiones diferentes. Es en ese contexto la evangelización también entraña impugnar las estructuras y las culturas de opresión y deshumanizantes que contradicen los valores del reino de Dios. Es asimismo de esta manera que la acción del Espíritu Santo nos empodera para testimoniar con nuestros hechos que el buen vivir, la vida en abundancia, como proclama el Evangelio, se vive en comunidad, porque ahí las personas se encuentran, pueden dialogar cercanamente, compartir sus problemas y buscar soluciones juntas, pequeños grupos donde se manifiestan otras formas de espiritualidades en solidaridad y sororidad fraternal. Para terminar, desde América Latina y el Caribe, seguimos porfiando en pequeñas comunidades por la vida y la vida en abundancia, tal como Jesús la proclamó en nuevos gestos y nuevas miradas. Seguimos porfiando en las búsquedas de nuestras huellas en estas tierras sagradas para su sanación. Seguimos porfiando en el rescate de nuestras espiritualidades expresadas a través de nuestros cuerpos. Bendecimos nuestros ancestros y seguimos porfiadamente evangelizándonos con la bendición de Dios traducida en espacios para vivir plenamente. En las palabras de Violeta Parra, campesina chilena, damos gracias a la vida que nos ha dado tanto. Cam San Jamidá. It's been my pleasure and privilege uh, to lead the work of the St. Paul's Mission of India, which is the official outreach evangelism work of the Syrian Orthodox Church in India. What is so distinct about this particular mission work of our church in India is that it happens in villages all over India. Now we have mission work in about 18 states in India. And we concentrate among Dalits and Adivasis of the Indian population. And this is radically altering the ecclesial demography of the church because in the Syrian Orthodox Church, it is almost exclusively the so-called Syrian high caste population that makes the uh, ecclesial population of the Syrian Orthodox Church in India. mission work, through this outreach evangelism work, we've been able to work among Dalits and Adivasis who are joining the Syrian Orthodox Church in India, which has changed the ecclesial demography completely radically. I think that's an important uh, aspect of our mission work. The Association of Protestant Churches and Missions in Germany is both acting worldwide and acting in Germany. So we do not implement directly ourselves our projects and programs, but we always work together with partners at the WCC, at the World Communion of Reformed Churches and the Lutheran World Federations. But we have partners in Germany as well, churches, universities, seminaries, and amongst others, the Mission Academy. At the Academy of Mission, a course was initiated to train leaders of African migrant churches in the north of Germany. In 2001, the first class of the African Theological Training in Germany, short ATIC, was constituted. 
Vision Academy is an expression of the insight within the ecumenical movement that uh, the churches and the propagation of the faith and engaging with people needs studying of the context. It means training and learning together to be uh, witnesses uh, to the living God. I believe we should take Attic as individuals and apply what we learn into our practical lives instead of uh, dividing the Africans and the Germans and uh, their differences and having just meetings on intercultural or ecumenical dialogues, but coming together and doing it practically. Our final presentation is by Bishop Dr. Givargis Morkorilos from the Syrian Orthodox Patriarchate of Antioch and all the East. He is Metropolitan of Niranam in India and moderator of the World Council of Churches Commission on World Mission and Evangelism. He is also president of St. Paul's Mission the Mission and Evangelism Program of the Syrian Orthodox Church in India, which you saw on the video, and the chairperson of the Student Christian Movement of India and of the India Center for Social Change. Straight after the bishop's presentation, the Teatro Ecumenical will conclude our plenary and lead us out in mission. Bishop. Namaste. I greet you in the most precious name of the Holy Trinity. Friends, I have been asked to present to you the main affirmations of the new WCC Mission and Evangelism Statement entitled Together Towards Life, Mission and Evangelism in Changing Landscapes. Hereafter, I will refer to the document as TTL, Together Towards Life. For reasons of time, I would like to focus only on a few important affirmations of TTL here. In fact, just four of them. Firstly, according to TTL, mission is essentially affirmation of Trinitarian life. In this sense, what TTL offers is Missio Trinitatis. It affirms that the triune God is the God of life and that we are called to participate in the life-affirming mission of the Holy Trinity, itself the source and fountain of mission. Hence, TTL would define mission as the outpouring of love, justice, and equality that characterize and bind together the Holy Trinity. The Trinitarian life that TTL affirms is the result of perichoresis, the mutual indwelling and sharing of love, justice, and harmony among the members of the divine Trinitarian community. Trinitarian life, or fullness of life, therefore, is in clear contradiction with the market-offered luxurious life, which is being privatized and enjoyed by an elite minority, often at the expense of a vast majority. Trinitarian life is derived from a Trinitarian economy of life, which fosters sharing justice and fairness, fullness of life for all. However, economic globalization today has effectively supplanted the God of life with its own un-God of mammon, the God of free market capitalism that propagates a soteriology of saving the world through creation of undue wealth and prosperity. Countering such idolatrous visions and denouncing, denouncing the economy of greed in the strongest possible language, TTL offers a countercultural mystiology. TTL also affirms in no uncertain terms that, I quote, a denial of life is a rejection of the God of life, unquote. It implies that a Trinitarian mission is one that affirms all life. TTL treats life in its holistic sense, inclusive of biological, 
social economic ecological and eternal dimensions of life this is an inclusive vision of mission where there is no space for discrimination of anyone on any basis mission therefore is to turn to the triune god secondly the missiology of ttl is spirit centered a distinct focus on pneumatology is one of the salient features of ttl the holy spirit is discerned wherever life in its fullness is affirmed where the oppressed are liberated where broken communities are healed and reconciled and where creation is restored therefore the scope of the mission of the holy spirit is not confined to the ecclesial community alone but is encountered outside the church as well where struggles for fullness of life and justice take place another highlight of ttl is the specific accent on spirituality as mission christian witness is not only what we do in mission but also how we live out mission in other words the being mode of mission is as important as its doing mode authentic mission is sustained by spiritualities that have deep roots in trinitarian community of love justice and integrity of creation put differently mission as ascesis expressed in authentic christian lifestyles is what accords mission of the spirit credibility to the extent that our lives in the world around us march with that of christ we witness to christ in other words when there is no mismatch between what we proclaim and how we live out the gospel mission is authentically and powerfully exercised in our own times the hugely influential example of the present bishop of rome pope francis is a great manifestation of mission as as cases the mission spirituality that ttl articulates is transformative it resists all life negating values and systems wherever they are at work this echoes a similar challenge expressed in the edinburgh 2010 common call and i quote our faithfulness to god and to god's free gift of life compels us to confront idolatrous assumptions unjust systems politics of domination and exploitation in our current world of economic order unquote this means as ttl puts it that mission of the holy spirit does necessarily entail discernment of evil spirits where forces of destruction and death still prevail mission therefore is to turn to the holy spirit who transforms life thirdly ttl affirms a missiology that is creation centered creation and celebration of life are deemed a missionary activity of god in fact the very act of missio day begins with the act of creation ttl affirms gospel as good news for every part of creation and every aspect of our life and reality god's mission therefore is cosmic when the planet is facing such serious threats as global warming climate change exploitation of nature due to excessive greed and undue profit motives mission as quest for eco justice is hugely important here again ttl breaks new grounds it breaks new grounds in that it goes beyond those understandings of mission that tend to conceive and practice mission in anthropocentric and instrumental sense that is mission as something done by humanity to nature we tend to forget that in many ways creation is in mission to humanity for instance nature and its resources have the power to heal in other words ttl does not present creation as a mere object of human concern but as an active agent of god's mission that channels god's grace and blessing mission therefore is to turn to god in creation fourthly and lastly ttl affirms mission from the margins in my view the defining feature of ttl 
is its delineation of the paradigm mission from the margins. It is here that one can feel the heartbeats of the document, if you will. In today's world, all life is imperiled. The most crucial threats to life today are manifested in the form of social, economic, ecological, and nuclear injustice. Life is valued hierarchically in contexts where systems of social and economic hegemony are in control. This is where mission from the margins as an alternative missiological paradigm assumes great pertinence. It challenges the conventional wisdom that mission is always done by the powerful to the powerless, by the rich to the poor, by the global north to the global south, and by the center to the margins. As TTL would put it, I quote, people on the margins have agency and can often see what for the center is out of view. People on the margins know what exclusionary forces are threatening their survival and best discern the urgency of their struggles. Through struggles in and for life, the marginalized people are reservoirs of the, of the active hope, collective resistance, and perseverance that are needed to remain faithful to the promised reign of God." Unquote. Through the pain and pathos of daily experiences of life-denying forces, the marginalized come to know their God of life. This is the unique epistemological faculty that the marginalized are endowed with, that TTL considers as important in discerning the life-affirming spirit and mission. To borrow the words of Gobal Guru, a leading Indian sociologist, and I quote, only the marginalized have the moral stamina to effect social change and transformation. This would imply that the driving force of mission would be the moral power of the marginalized and not the hegemonic power of money or mammon. This is the dynamic agency of the marginalized that TTL advocates. This is mission from the margins, not to the margins. This is not even mission at the margins, where the marginalized are treated as mere recipients of charity. Mission from the center, motivated by paternalistic attitudes and superiority complex, has often been complicit with life-denying and oppressive systems. In its place, the alternative missionary movement of mission from the margins claims active agency of mission for the marginalized. God chooses the vulnerable, those at the margins, to fulfill God's mission of establishing justice and peace. People on the margins are thus the primary agents of God's mission, where, as Jesus said, the last would be the first. The purpose of mission here is not simply to move people from the margins to the center, but to challenge those, both systems and people, who remain at the center by keeping people on the margins. This has implications for churches as they are challenged to transform their own power structures. This is an urgent challenge that the global church, mission agencies, and the ecumenical movement as a whole need to address urgently. Mission, therefore, is to turn to the margins. To conclude, churches are called to meet the triune God of life at the margins of life, where the victims of oppressive and life-negating forces have taken over the agency of God's life-affirming mission. This should also challenge the churches to join civil society initiatives that are already engaged in struggles for human rights, justice, and fullness of life. What can and must challenge the ecumenical movement today is nothing but the cries of people at the margins for life. Let us echo these cries for justice through prayer and action. Let us commit ourselves to the mission of God by turning to the life-affirming triune God. We will do that in humility and in hope, with courage and with commitment, by choosing life over against death, and by joining the margins where struggles for justice, peace, and integrity of creation are already on. With those in struggles for life, let us pray together. 
would you kindly join me in saying aloud the assembly theme prayer as if we echo the cry of the oppressed right now right here let us say together loudly god of life lead us into justice and peace thank you god of life. Shall we sing together first? Ready? One, two, three, four. We are one. We are one in mission. We seek. We seek for fullness of life. Now we shall accompany our singing with some movements. Everybody, please stand up. Thank you. Okay. Very easy. So we, when we say we are one, we do this. We are one. We are one in mission. We seek. We seek for fullness of life. Okay, with, let's try the movement together. We are one. We are one in mission. We seek. We seek for fullness of life okay and then we combine that with our singing ready one two three four we are one we are one in mission we seek we seek for fullness of life one more we are one of life. One more together. We are one. We are one in mission. We seek. We seek for our fullness of life. As we leave this hall, this auditorium, let us continue singing and continue our mission. One, two, three, four. We are one. of life we are one we are one mission we seek we seek for fullness of life 